Okay. All right. Good. Right. All right. No. You guys ready? Okay, so we're going to go ahead and oops. Let me turn this down a little bit. We're going to we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so first of all, I'd like to start by welcoming everybody and thanking you for uh, taking uh, taking some time out of your lunch hour to uh, hear the, this panel on this incredibly important topic of preventing technology and technologically facilitated exploitation. I'm John Diasnor. I run the Digital Technologies Initiative uh, here at the Luskin Center. Uh, and the format of this is what we're going to do is I'll, I'll start out by briefly introducing uh, each of our panelists. Uh, each panelist will then have uh, about five minutes to basically give kind of an opening opening set of remarks, as, as we were, on this topic. And then I've got a set of questions that I'll be going through, and then uh, we'll be uh, opening it up uh, for audience questions. Uh, so let me start by introducing uh, really this, this uh, incredible panel we have here. I'll start uh, with... Um, the person uh, just to my right, uh, Mr. Ernie Allen. Uh, uh, Mr. Allen has been a world leader uh, in, the flight, in, the, in the fight against child abduction, uh, sexual exploitation, sexual violence, and human trafficking. He is the co-founder, president, and CEO of the International Center for Missing and Exploited Children, sometimes called ICMEC. Previously, he was the president and CEO of the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, uh, which he co-founded, and he was the CEO for 23 years. During his tenure at NICMEC, more than 180,000 missing children were recovered. He created the National 24-Hour Missing Children Hotline, provided training for more than 300,000 law enforcement officers, created the Child Victim Identification Program that reviewed and analyzed tens of millions of child pornography images and videos attempting to identify and save child victims. He created a cold case unit, which does not stop looking for a missing child until the case is resolved. And he launched a program to help U.S. Marshals track down more than 100,000 fugitive sex offenders and much, and much more. Uh, he's, his work has been recognized by four U.S. presidents, and he's the recipient of many, many awards, which I won't read here because we wouldn't have time for the rest of the panel if I kept reading it. But he's obviously been uh, arguably the person on the planet who's uh, really done the most uh, in this incredibly, incredibly important area. Um, immediately to his left is Ms. Amanda Hess. Um, Amanda Hess is a staff writer at Slate uh, and the co-founder of Tomorrow Magazine. Her work has appeared in Wired, ESPN, the magazine, Elle, the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, and the Village Voice. Uh, her January 2014 Pacific Standard cover story, Why Women Aren't Welcome on the Internet, won the Hillman Foundation's Sydney Award for Outstanding Socially Conscious Journalism. I've read a lot of her work and it's absolutely terrific article. So we're very honored to have her here as well. Immediately uh, to her left is uh, Adrian Chandley. Um, Adrian Chandley is a program manager uh, at Microsoft uh, and uh, quite relevant to this uh, panel. He leads the work to combat child exploitation content in the Microsoft search engine, Bing. Uh, he also contributes to multiple online safety initiatives within Microsoft and led the response to the UK Prime Minister David Cameron's challenge for internet companies to do more to protect our children. Um, he continues to innovate in the design and development of technologies to support this ongoing effort uh, at Microsoft and to engage more broadly. Uh, and then finally, uh, last but certainly not least, uh, Mr. Cody Monk uh, is with the Federal Bureau of Investigation. He's a special, special agent based in Houston, Texas, where he walk, works closely, closely with academic institutions on cyber intelligence issues. Uh, before returning to Houston, uh, uh, Mr. Monk was the Counterintelligence Division's Academic Alliance National Program Manager, where he saw the FBI's outreach to the academic community. Uh, and um, also, quite notably, with respect to the panel here, he was on uh, a task force uh, convened by ICMEC, the International Center for Missing and Exploited Children, to uh, study the digital economy and how that is uh, raising issues that need attention. He was a, a valued member of that task force. So a really terrific group of panelists. Um, so with that, I will turn it over. I guess we'll start with uh, Ernie Allen to uh, give us the introduction. Thank you, John. I'm honored to be here. Thanks to JR and the, and the Luskin Center for, for doing this. Uh, let me begin by saying, by stating the perfectly obvious, and that is that we are fervent believers in the power of technology uh, to help solve social problems. It's doing that. It's changed the way the world searches for missing children protects children from abuse and exploitation. However, uh, the face of exploitation 
today is different than it's ever been. And the challenges, the causes of the technology are greater than they've, ever, than they've ever been. For example, last year, a man in Sweden was convicted of the rape of children when he wasn't even in the same country as the children when they were assaulted. Now you ask, how is that possible? Well, what he did was hire men in the Philippines to obtain children as young as five and then sexually assault them via webcam while he directed the action from his home in Sweden. Swedish authorities called it virtual trafficking. That is the face of the new problem of child exploitation in, in this era. Uh, I want to mention very briefly in my five minutes three categories of particular concern uh, that are directly tied to technology and sexual exploitation. One is the exploding problem of child pornography. It is off the charts because of the power of, of the internet. There's a very basic reason. A generation ago, someone who was interested in sexual images of prepubescent children felt isolated, aberrant, alone. Today, they're part of a global community. Uh, a recent estimate by a Canadian researcher is that 1% of the world's male population is aroused by pedophilic stimuli. There are 3.5 billion men on the planet today. 1% is 35 million people. So regardless of what that number is, clearly there is a massive audience for this kind of content. Uh, people who network with each other online, who trade images, who trade fantasies, who trade techniques, and in some cases even trade children. So this is a problem that is exploited. Second issue I want to mention is the migration of human trafficking from the streets to the internet. Today there are internet sites that market, advertise, and sell human beings for sex, including in the United States of America. Uh, this is a problem that is complex because of the challenges of free speech and a free and unfettered internet, uh, but it's one that we have to come to grips with because it is impacting millions of children around the world. And the third one is perhaps the most difficult to get hold of, and that is the challenge of internet anonymity. Uh, several years ago, in the infinite wisdom of the U.S. government, uh, a tool was developed that allowed political dissidents and journalists in oppressive regime, repressive regimes to use the Internet without leaving an IP address. Uh, obviously, nobody considered that perhaps others besides dissidents and journalists would use that tool. And that is exactly what's happening today. And we are witnessing a virtual arms race to create a more anonymous, more impenetrable internet. Uh, I've been going around the world preaching that in the aftermath of the Snowden affair and the NSA controversy, that all of us espouse the greatest possible protection for individual privacy, which should not be penetrated absent probable cause and legal process. But I've also been preaching that absolute internet anonymity is a prescription for disaster. Law enforcement has to have the ability to trace uh, those who use it for unlawful purposes. And because of internet anonymity, what we see today is the emergence of something that is frequently called the dark web or the deep web. Internet sites that operate an, uh, anonymously using digital currencies and digital economy tools to maintain the commercial aspects uh, sites where you can traffic in human beings and weapons and drugs and child pornography. I submit to you that the technology challenges that we face in the area of child exploitation today are massive. But I believe just as technology is a core of the problem, it is also the core of the solution. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Thank you for having me. Um, I think unlike some of the other panelists, I really first came to this issue as someone who uh, experienced digital exploitation, um, and then, you know, uh, later started to investigate it as a journalist. Uh, so I want to tell you a story about something that happened to me last August when I was on vacation with my friends in Palm Springs. Um, I woke up in the morning. And I found that someone had created an anonymous Twitter account that was dedicated to uh, me. Uh, and 
it said a few things. It, you know, it started by saying, I, I read something you wrote, and I didn't like it, which is a very normal response. I get that maybe like 10 or 15 times a day. And then they said, you are that ugly pig, which is also, you know, not totally abnormal. It's something I'll get maybe like once a month. And from there they said, I know where you live. I'm going to come to your house. I'm going to cut your head off. And I'm going to rape you. Um, and obviously, you know, as a human being, I found that very unpleasant. But as a journalist, I actually found it very fascinating because my sort of experience of figuring out what to do and what even this phenomenon was, uh, was sort of full of contradictions. Uh, and it started in me sort of trying to understand whether, just how to understand what this person had said against me and whether it was a crime or not. Uh, so I sort of talked to friends and people I worked with and asked them what they thought I should do about it. About half of them said, you know what, um, he's probably not going to come to your house and cut your head off. It's like a very rare occurrence. Uh, so you should just forget about it. It's just something that someone said online. And the other half of people said, well, he might not do that, but he's obviously, um, you know, a bit unhinged if he's genitating this Twitter account for you. So you should call the police and try to, like, put him in jail or something. So uh, I thought I would be safe, and I called the cops. Um, and from there, uh, you know, it was a very confusing process. And I called 911. I got a cop in Palm Springs, which is a place where I didn't live. Surely, uh, you know, probably my attacker didn't live there either. And so I ended up having to interface with a local police force uh, about a crime that was potentially national or international. Um, and uh, because we didn't know who had created this account, the police really wanted to discount this as a, even a potential crime. So they said, you know, this guy could be living in Nebraska. I know he says that he lives in your state, but we really don't know that. Uh, which was a bit of a paradox because in order for them to actually figure that out, they would have to, I'm sure uh, we can talk about this more later, but you know, subpoena Twitter uh, to uh, find out exactly who this person was. Um, and because they didn't, they weren't sure if he had committed a crime, uh, then they were unable to do that. Um, so from there, I really found that, that this is, uh, you know, in talking with other women who have experienced this, and I ended up writing about how women experience this different from men, although it's it's a story you could tell about really any marginalized group. Um, they had been told similar things uh, by police when they have um, reported these crimes. Uh, and police would say, uh, this is Twitter's problem. You should talk to Twitter about having them delete these comments from their account. And Twitter would say, you know, this is a crime you should report it to the police. And so there was sort of a passing of the buck back and forth between these two institutions. Uh, and you know, whoever's in the right really leaves the victim with very little recourse for sort of understanding what to do. Um, and so there are all these ways that this uh, digital expression of misogyny uh, had created sort of new wrinkles for understanding how to pursue um, criminal action against these people and, and whether or not to see them as crimes and how to see them as crimes. But I also found that um, we were really sort of reliving a lot of experiences that women have had uh, in real life, you know, off of the internet, uh, just in this new place. Um, so before, you know, if a woman would say, uh, her, maybe her intimate partner had, had threatened to kill her, and she went to the police with it. It's possible that um, she would get a response back that was, you know, this is a he said, she said argument. Uh, and we can't really prove exactly what happened. Um, but in this case, uh, there is proof. Uh, so whether it's someone like me who was harassed by ostensibly a stranger, it could be someone I know, but I really don't know, um, or someone who's harassed by her boyfriend um, online, often the response from law enforcement is, well, uh, there's proof, obviously, but it's not as real of a crime as something that might happen to you in person. Um, and as someone who also really appreciates the internet, I find that very insulting because many of us live our lives there. I work there. Um, people date there and, and marry people with me off of the internet. Uh, people study there. They go to school on the internet. Um, and so all of these places that we've uh, created laws about to sort of help women navigate the world, uh, whether it's laws against sexual harassment in the workplace 
or laws against discrimination at school, um, or laws against domestic violence, have not sort of fully integrated themselves into the internet. Uh, so we're seeing women trying to date online and work online and study online, but not being able to fall back on the, all of these civil rights laws that have sprung up to protect them uh, in physical space. Um, so I'm so happy to be here so that I can hear from uh, all of these people about different ways that we might be able to approach those kinds of crimes. And again, even though this is something that I think really affects women differently, um, of course, I would not only be defended by this person, but also race. Um, it's also something that really affects all of us. Uh, so I'm very excited to be able to sort of look to the future about see how we can deal with it. Thank you very much. I'll start by posing you a couple of questions for thinking. So when you go home at night and you search the internet for pictures of cats, as we all do, <laughs> and this isn't an intervention, um, <laughs> do you stop and think, wow, this is all cats, you know, Microsoft, Google did a great job, and I've got lots of cats. Do you think, well, this is cool, I don't see the same picture twice in the search results. You know, I know I uploaded 10 copies of this picture to different sites, but there's only one showing. That's kind of clever too. Are these things that you think about? Um, do you think about how many pages there are on the internet? Um, how long is it going to take? There's too many. Somewhere in between 30 trillion and 60 trillion. Effectively. Um, so these are some of the, the scale problems that we deal with. We can't know. No, we don't have special technology that we can do with cats. Uh, that's not a cat scan at school. <laughs> um, but we do have technology that looks at the entire internet, or as much of it as we can see, and understands how it connects to each other. And when you look at that, figure out what is the most relevant content, you can learn what things are. So when you point to something on a web page and say, look, a picture of a cat, that means that there is a clue that it's a picture of a cat. And that's going to be very helpful. And as well, that's not to do with child exploitation protection. These are the techniques that we will actually use to determine whether we have content on our website. Um, so we actually look at exploitation in, in, in hacking in three ways. One is Technologies that provide tools for users to protect themselves, so spare and safety tools. We provide education to help people of all ages and abilities understand how to protect themselves on the internet. And we partner. Uh, we partner with Ernie, the American Action Center for Missing and Endangered Children, uh, the Thorn Foundation here in, in, in Los Angeles, with the great global reach. Uh, the IWF Internet Watch Foundation in the UK, the law enforcement around the world, um, Paul in the UK, US law enforcement. And we also cooperate with our competitors to work together. This isn't a who can do this best kind of problem. This is a how do we work together to solve these problems. We're referring back to one of our partners, CEOP in the UK. Um, they're part of the NSA, which is kind of the UK's version of the FBI. Uh, they think about the problems and the types of technology that Ernie spoke about and, um, as a sort of pyramid. And at the bottom of that pyramid is this very thin slice. So the pyramid represents sort of all the bad actors that are trading this information on the internet. At the bottom of the pyramid is the, the sort of the casual, the curious person that's starting to maybe think about these sorts of contents and is starting to use things like search engines in a curious way. Um, so so CIOP don't see search engines as being the heart of the problem, but they see us, and, and I believe them, as a part of the solution because we're, we're at this moment in time where a curious user first starts searching for something. We have that moment to educate them, to tell them what is wrong, and obviously we do what we can to stop them finding new content on the um, and with respect to technology, I talked about how do we tell whether a cat picture is the same. 
Um, we developed some technology called PhotoDNA with Dartmouth College. And what this does is it helps us identify the two images of the same. Uh, the technology is called PhotoDNA. And what it does is it takes an image and it dilutes it down, resizes it, uh, actually combs it to monochrome, and then creates a sort of fingerprint for DNA for the image. And we save these hashes, PhotoDNA hashes, of known images. And with NetMax help, we built a database off of known fingerprints for illegal images. And now we can find any replicas of those images as we go through the internet. So with Bing, every day we're searching through our index to see what images there are in the index that might match any of these, and whether it's saved in a different format, whether it's been resized, uh, we will find it and we will move it. Um, we also, as we crawl the web, uh, just as a fact, we talked about, well, I talked about 30 trillion pages. Um, we download tens of billions of pages every day as a search engine, and then Google will be pretty much the same. Um, so there's no way that anything can be done by humans at that scale. And we have to rely on technology, and photo DNA is one way that we do that. Um, the other techniques I sort of talked about as well. And so we use those as we crawl the internet. Every image that we process, we look at as well. And that's a lot more than the index. And what we have found is over, uh, for every image that NetMap provides as a hash for, we will typically find five additional images in the internet. Uh, so some will find none, some will find hundreds. And we report all of those locations to NetMap so that they can be acted upon, and we remove them from our search unit. Now, the problem is bigger than this. NetMac um, is responsible for identifying victims, and, and that's crucially important. We do everything that we can to help them and to make sure that victims aren't reoffended. Um, but there's much more content on the internet that it effectively represents um, child exploitation, gratification. And from, from a Bing point of view, you know, we don't want our users having to see that content. And so it's a much bigger problem for us to find all of that content that isn't necessarily strictly illegal, but it is certainly not a nice experience if anybody has to see it. Um, some laws in different countries are different as well. Uh, cartoons are illegal in, say, the UK, but not in the US. And you would have to try and get in with local law. Um, so proto-DNA is an important tool, and it's more important because um, through NetMac we've partnered and we share that with industry. So it's not just you know, Microsoft doing this. Everybody in the industry is using this as an law enforcement to find these images, to get them out of the systems, and to build more hashes of known illegal images so that we can remove them as quickly as we possibly can. And I think we're making some great strides this year that will significantly increase the speed at which we can remove content, or understand it, remove it from the search engine so it can't be found. Uh, then another area that we're looking at, um, there are some that we, we can't really discuss, but as part of the recent events in the UK where the Prime Minister, David Cameron, brought this to the media's attention, um, an effort has started between the Internet Watch Foundation Google, Microsoft, and, and see up the law enforcement now to see what we can do around the problem of torrents that share um, child exploitation content. So torrents are sort of one step into the sort of darker internet. Um, and BitTorrent particularly is interesting because um, BitTorrent leaves these files in, if you like, the regular internet, the .torrent files, which provide maps into the peer, peer networks. And so they will bridge that sort of second step. And so whatever we can do to stop that step, which is another thing that we're doing we're trying to stop this is, is so th there's a lot going on with the technology to try and combat this. Um, it, it's never going to end. Um, and we're achieving a lot more by working together. And I think it will be very brilliant. Yeah, thank you very much. Ready? Yeah, good morning, <clears throat> or good afternoon uh, to everyone. I appreciate uh, the Western School and UCLA for having us here. Thanks to JR, Susan, and, and John for uh, arranging this, this panel. Um, already had some 
very uh, astute comments here. I'm looking forward to the, the question and answer session. I, I'm going to just uh, tell one quick story, and then I'm going to cede my time for, uh, for John's questions and, and, uh, and to hear from the audience. Um, L.A. is uh, uh, it's quite a different place from where I grew up. Uh, I grew up on the uh, on a cattle ranch in the far reaches of West Texas, and my my father is uh, he still still lives in that area, still does a lot of work in that in that industry. And about a week ago, I was having a conversation with him, telling him about what was going to go on here and some of the things that we were going to discuss and some of the things that uh, that we hope to to accomplish. And I can almost hear the boredom on the other end of the line as I'm, as I'm telling him all about what's going on. And he finally stops me in mid-sentence and he says, let me ask you a question. Said, what's that, Dad? And he said, is the FBI ever going to get any work out of you? <laughs> <laughs> very, very, very direct thing that you would expect from, uh, from someone of that generation and, and someone in that industry. And I said, well, Dad, what do you mean? I spent 10 years as a journalist, right? So I'm always going to deflect the question right? and try to get more information. And I said, what do you mean by that, Dad? Tell me, tell me specifically why you, uh, why you don't think the Bureau's getting any work out of it. He said, well, when's the last time you've arrested somebody? When's the last time you used those handcuffs that they gave you? And I thought that was a really interesting question, specifically in the, uh, in the domain that we're discussing here. Because if we arrest somebody, for the most part, in this domain, it's probably a pretty bad day. And it's a bad day maybe because something has happened. And I'm going to, and, and, and I'm going to lead off into, into what I hope to discuss, and we'll discuss more than nuts and bolts of the actual technology when we get into the, uh, the second part of the panel. But Amanda's story really bothers me. And it, it bothers me because, to me, that, 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 that possibly was a failure. And it was a failure because as, as, as the FBI, we are always trying to do three things. We're trying to produce good policy, publish that policy, and proliferate that policy. And the fourth, and this is the most important, partner. And we have to do this a little bit better in this domain. And Adrian mentioned it when he mentioned it. And I think it's exemplified by Amanda's story. And that there was a failure of partnership somewhere along the line in that case, and I think we see a, sometimes a failure uh, to, to proliferate the right kind of information uh, in these types of cases. And we'll, when we talk to, to the, about the specific technologies, I'll get a little bit more into that. So I'm going to end my comments there by saying that a lot of things that I'm going to talk about today involve partnering, involve doing a better job of partnering, and doing a better job of sharing information that allows local law enforcement to understand when a case like Amanda's happens, what exactly should they do? And also to educate the community in general, is if something like this does happen, what kind of processes should you go through to see that something like this gets addressed? But thank you very much for everyone's comments. So um, uh, first question here is, uh, to the extent that we haven't already ha had it, what are the various categories? And, and by the way, these questions, we don't need to answer them, you know, whoever wants to speak up, but what are the various categories of techn technologically facilitated exploitation, and how has the landscape evolved in recent years? Uh, Ernie, you mentioned one anecdote, and you know, many other, uh, how it, you know, people may not understand fully the scope of, of, of what's happening here. I think, I think one of the ways in which it's changed, I'd be interested specifically to hear Adrian and Ernie's opinion on this, but specifically the, the internet has, has has been a game changer, much like it's it's been a disruptive technology in a lot of a lot of industries. In, in this world, it's also been a disruptive technology in that it's taken the uh, it's taken that barrier in a lot of ways between victim and offender away, in which victim and offender now in in, in a lot of ways are connected, maybe without the offender even knowing. But going back to a very basic technology. Uh, the way in which a lot of this, a lot of these things used to be traded was simply scanned pictures. Well, the internet has the internet has broken down that barrier. Whereas you are getting now, you are getting specific videos. You are getting uh, very specific requests being filled from offender to offender. So that that playing field has has changed quite a bit. And this is just and this hasn't been this has this is not a, a, a uh, this is not something that just happened recently. This has been going on now for uh, at least from, from our perspective for at least the last five six, seven years, but we've got to try to get in front of that. We have to try to, to, 
at least our job from a partnership perspective is how do we get in front of that? How do we how do we predict, so to speak, how how the next wave is going to happen? What's going to happen in this deep web? Is it the proliferation of virtual currencies becoming uh, becoming even more important? Do we see this as something that's going to be uh, used for commercial gain even more than it is, or is it going to remain an offender to offender uh, industry? Okay, a couple of couple of quick comments. Uh, I think one of the greatest challenges in terms of technology is simply the pace of change, the migration from one technology to another. When we when we began, when Adrian and and our friends at Google and Yahoo and others began trying to address this phenomenon of child pornography, which I think, as everyone knows, is misnamed, misunderstood. It has nothing to do with pornography or speech. These are crime scene photos. These are images of the sexual abuse of a child. The Supreme Court of the United States 30 years ago said this is not protected speech. So, but one of the challenges was, even with the advent of the internet, what we saw was our goal was to identify these images on central servers. When an offender is brought to justice, the big challenge was, you know, huzzah, justice is achieved, but the photos of the victim stay out there forever. So how do we deal with that? How do we interdict in the redistribution of those images? So the original approach was to match images and make sure that they weren't residing on the servers of companies like Microsoft. Uh, the problem is then along came peer-to-peer -peer technology and file sharing where there is no central server. Uh, and Adrian mentioned BitTorrent, you know, breaking of images up into pieces and then reassembling it at another end. The, the, the progress of technology uh, represents a real challenge. And I heard a story years ago that I believe is absolutely true, and I repeat over and over again, but it is allegedly historic fact that when the automobile was introduced, law enforcement leaders opposed it. They said only the criminals will have the cars and we'll be chasing on foot and on horseback. And our greatest challenge is in human history, it happens over and over again. So our greatest challenge is simply to help law enforcement catch up. Uh, John and I recently co-chaired this digital economy task force. And to my friends at the JR, my friends at UCLA, this man is a national treasure. The work he did was extraordinary, and I think it's changing policy uh, around the world. Um, but one of the biggest challenges is when we talk to law enforcement around the world about how they investigate these kinds of crimes in this new setting, and places like uh, the deep web, where there is uh, great difficulty in penetrating who the users are and how they're using the technology, what I heard over and over again was two things. One is that our primary technique is infiltration. We try to get people into the system. Cody will tell you that infiltration is expensive, time consuming, and usually not effective. The other way that you make cases is you wait for offenders to make mistakes. If someone connects from a, a non-Tor IP in the deep web to a Tor IP outside the deep web, they leave a trail. Now, our argument was, we concluded, that that's not enough. And the FBI has done a couple of remarkable investigations recently that indicates they're on the cutting edge on this. The takedown of Silk Road is one example. Uh, the shutdown of uh, Freedom Hosting, which the FBI has called the largest facilitator of child pornography on the planet. However, for most law enforcement in the world today, frankly, we're catching the really dumb ones. We're catching the offenders who make mistakes. We're not catching the offenders who represent the organized criminals who represent the greatest threat to the world's children and to, to the world order. So the migration of technology, I submit, is our, our single greatest challenge. Um, in terms of the exploitation of women, it's, a, it's such a different challenge because I think uh, you know, hopefully everyone recognizes that the exploitation of children is wrong. And I don't think that's true when it comes to adult women. Um, so I found that people who harass women online are really sort of fighting against 
social norms uh, as opposed to being in more of a legal framework because so often it's not criminalized. Um, so on the internet, you see people, you know, there's like this vast cornucopia of tactics that people can use to really reduce women to their bodies in new ways, whether it's through posting revenge porn, which is, you know, photographs of women that were meant to be private that are publicized, um, photoshopping women's faces onto porn scenes or other sort of embarrassing material, um, threats, uh, just sort of garden variety harassment. Um, and I think this accomplishes sort of two things. One, you know, we're starting to criminalize something like revenge porn, for example, but for a long time we didn't sort of see it in a criminal framework, so they can sort of get by that way. And I think it also takes a while for society to catch up and for people to realize that these are actions that are not just jokes or mean, but are actually discriminating against women and uh, chilling their participation in online society. Yeah, we, we see a lot of uh, people complaining about um, revenge porn sites, other sites. There's been a, a lot of sites showing up that are effectively just making money on the embarrassment of others, and it's a complicated area. Uh, free speech is important, but you know, so is protecting people. Um, so you know, it's it's interesting. I know that there's a lot of work going on in legislation. Uh, around effective wisdom and voyeurism kind of areas of consent for uh, imagery. Uh, but it's a complicated area. Uh, from a search engine point of view, with the masses of data that we have, it's very difficult for us to know what is legitimate, what is real. Um, when somebody complains about something or has an issue, uh, it's hard for us to really know whether that person is the person that they're trying to be. Um, I'm not making excuses, I'm just saying it's a, it's a problem of scale and we need to work together to figure out how to solve some of these problems. Thank you. Um, you know, the question is uh, actually keys off of, of Nano, your, your comment. Um, cyber stalking and harassment uh, disproportionately target women. And how does this chill online participation by women and what are some steps that we could take to address this? A question for anybody, although uh, Amanda is key off of you. Um, I could start, although you can see what everyone else thinks. Um, you know, it's interesting because if you look at participation rates on the internet, women participate about as much as men do, which is a lot. Uh, but if you look at the people who are really sort of creating these societies, whether it's um, people who run and work for technology companies or um, people who run online journalism outlets, these are places that are dominated by men, like many parts of our world. Um, and so I think it's it's important to take sort of harassment against women in this context where women are literally marginalized already on the internet. And so when people come around and say, you know, it's not that I dislike your idea, but that but because you are the person saying it and you are a woman, I'm going to harass you because of like the status of your body. Um, it's it's just another sort of factor that reminds women that they're not totally welcome in this space. Um, and that's something that is depressing to me as a woman, but also as a human, because I think, you know, in order for the internet to be this wonderful place that many have envisioned that it could be, it's really important that we get, you know, the best ideas and the smartest ideas and the funniest ideas and like the cutest cat pictures. Um, and so when people say, you know, uh, you're not allowed to say this not because your idea is bad, but because you're a woman, it really sort of makes our entire society less brilliant than it could be. I'm Josh here. I'm the I'll, try, I'll try to be brief. Um, no, I think that this is one of the arguments for internet anonymizing tools. One of the principal beneficiaries for Tor, for the Invisible Internet Project, and for similar technologies, anonymous technologies. Uh, are women who are targets of harassment, uh, who are, you know, trying to protect themselves. So, you know, I, I did not mean to suggest earlier that Tor is a bad idea. I'm in favor of it. I think there's enormous use. The challenge is there have to be limits. There have to be the ability to penetrate 
a, a tour or a similar tool for limited purposes by law enforcement. And our argument is there's a difference between privacy and anonymity. But I think the ultimate protection in a situation like you described is to be able to engage in some level of communication without worrying about uh, a perpetrator penetrating that communication and using that to stalk you. So that's the challenge of the balancing act. Just for, just for those who may not know, raise your hand if you've heard of Tor. Because for the half of people who haven't, Tor is a, is a, it's a software that basically if, if someone like me goes to read an article in the New York Times and the New York Times knows the IP address of the computer that I'm using, uh, and if the New York Times cared, they could trace it to my, my very machine in, in this room if I'm in this room. Tor is software that, that people can download that basically makes it so you, you hop a few times. So you go from your computer to a couple of, of anonymous nodes out in the internet and then to the site that you're going to. And what that means is that if you're reading a New York Times article via Tor, the New York Times only knows that it's sending that article to some node in the network. It doesn't know that it's two or three hops later ending up in my computer. So that is, that's, when people talk about Tor here, that, that's what they're talking about. The benefits obviously are if you're a dissident in Syria looking at anti-government websites that can save your life, but if you're a criminal engaged in some of the things that we're talking about here, it can make it very hard to find who you are. That, that's what Tor is about. Um, uh, another, another few questions, then we'll open it up to some audience questions. Uh, given the global nature of today's communication systems, what's the best response to combat ex exploitation in which the producers and consumers of illicit content are often uh, in different countries. That's, that's, a, that's a new problem. We didn't have that problem, or at least not to the extent that we had, have today. We didn't have this 20 years ago. Today it's, it's become very new problem. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it is a growing problem. Um, we actually see uh, a bunch of scenarios. So there was the one that Ernie spoke to where he was uh, effectively paid for order use going on in a different country. Uh, but we also see some pretty horrific things happening um, around the exploitation and effectively uh, extortion of individuals that actually hop through different technologies. So a conversation may be struck up on a social network and it may transfer to something like Skype and then it may transfer to something else. And so it's a difficult chain, and the only way that we can break into these chains is by working together to figure out you know, how, how do we recognize these patterns, and how do we know when something bad is likely happening. It's a complicated problem, and the solutions are not going to be simple. Yeah, but in, from a law enforcement perspective, we actually have very good relationships with a lot of the international law enforcement organizations, and very, and also in other specific countries. Uh, we have a legal attaché program which uh, covers a wide variety of countries and covers a wide variety of issues. And what our attachés do is effectively they liaison in anything that would affect uh, FBI business in that country. And we have we have established just in the last several years actual cyber legal attachés that they look specifically at cyber crime. Now that could run all gamut of cyber crime. Could be. Uh, credit card fraud could be cyber intrusion, could be anything related to some sort of cyber issue that affects uh, the United States. Um, they also will look at this issue here. This is starting to become a burgeoning issue that is raising uh, it's raising its ugly head for our, a lot of our not only our, our legal attaches but specifically our cyber attaches. And as that happens, we've started to deepen relationships with some of these international law enforcement organizations and some of the specific organizations in these countries to go after. Um, if, if there is some sort of United States nexus, go after a case like Ernie's talking about. And, and let me add, there was a recent case last summer that John and I uh, looked at very closely in our Digital Economy Task Force in which a Costa Rica-based company, which was a centralized digital currency, uh, was in essence laundering the proceeds, $6 billion worth of illegal assets to bring down this company that was called Liberty Reserve and to arrest and, and indict their founder took the cooperation of 17 countries. That's the model that has to be emulated if we're going to have any kind of impact on this problem in the future. The case that triggered our initial financial coalition that led to this digital economy task force involved uh, producer or consumers, a, a site in Texas, 
uh, the servers were hosted in Latvia. The uh, business was based in Russia. Uh, the processing of the transactions happened in Florida. And the customers, every one of whom was violating the law, were all over the world. Most of them were Americans. But there were, there were potential people to be arrested and prosecuted in at least 50 countries. That's what we face today. So there's been a lot of talk about uh, uh, digital currencies. Uh, people, have people here heard of currencies like Bitcoin? So, um, so and some the, the detractors of currencies like that will argue that they are used uh, disproportionately for criminal purposes, and the defenders will argue uh, that lots of other financial transaction mechanisms like cash and credit cards have also been misused, and more, more often than misused, are used for perfectly legitimate uh, purposes. So in the nexus of exploitation, um, how much of a concern are uh, digital payment, digital currencies that are designed in part to mask the identity of the people transacting? How much of a concern does that provide over and above the concerns, you know, other concerns that we talk, we've already talked about? Well, I'll, I'll start. Uh, it's a concern. Uh, we think digital currencies, the digital economy is a good thing for two and a half billion adults on the planet today who don't have access to banks or credit cards. Uh, if you're a guest worker in Qatar being paid two dollars a day and you want to send money home to your family in Nepal, you're probably not going to want to pay a ten dollar transaction fee to a bank. Digital currencies offer the ability to provide financial inclusion for many of the world's poor. So we think it's a good thing. We think there's enormous potential. But there's also a dark side. And as we pointed out earlier, the primary payment mechanism in the deep web today is Bitcoin. Now, the Bitcoin Foundation is partnering with us in the Digital Economy Task Force, as is the Tor Project and others. The reality is it's unbanked, it's unregulated. These transactions don't move nation to nation. They move network to network. And what we believe has to happen is there needs to be the greatest possible consistency and uniformity in terms of how these transactions are treated. They're not overseen by any central bank right now. And we think the worst thing that could happen is draconian regulation, which would effectively just move these businesses and entrepreneurs out of the United States and into the Cayman Islands or, or other places. So what John and I have been trying to promote, and Cody is a member of the task force, is creating a balanced, reasonable approach. There's existing law that can be applied. Many of you read about the, the recent hack of a site in Japan called Mt. Gox, where a half billion dollars worth of Bitcoin assets disappeared. We don't know whether they disappeared into the hands of a Russian teenager, or some organized crime enterprise, or a, a terrorist network. But the reality is they disappeared. If Japan had been applying their money services business law, their money transmitter law, that would have been far less likely to have happened. And so what John and I are attempting to do is persuade countries around the world to use that approach and apply existing regulations at the exchange level where people want to trade their bitcoins for dollars or euros or pounds or yen. Before, before I make this comment, I will say that uh, the opinion I'm about to give you is not the opinion of the FBI or the Department of Justice. Simply my opinion. Um, if you want a really good look at this, uh, Wired Magazine last month did an excellent story on the, this exact debate that's actually going on inside Bitcoin, the Bitcoin user community. And it was a story about it, what is the fight for Bitcoin soul? Is it going to be something that's going to be part of the regulated economy? And if you're a hardcore Bitcoin user, no, you don't want that because that's exactly why, for the most part, why you're using a virtual currency is to get away from. Uh, from some sort of central regulation, whereas others would say, no, we need to become part of that in order to be legitimate, in order to keep criminals uh, from using, uh, criminals, child sex traffickers, child pornographers, et cetera, from using our currency as some sort of facilitation uh, product. I will tell you this, this is, this is a very large concern for us. It's a large concern for us, not simply uh, in the child sex trafficking area, it's a it's a large concern in general. Um, 
about three years ago, John and I and a colleague from Rice University actually looked at this issue uh, in a paper that, that the three of us did together, and where we looked at Bitcoin, virtual currencies, as a, as a tool for the unbanked to say, hey, look, you know, you've, you've got all the, like Ernie, Ernie gave the, the statistic, you have billions of people that don't have access to these sort of currencies. So from that perspective, it can be, it, it can be a very helpful thing. But for us as a law enforcement community, uh, having the ability to, we always say, look for the money, whether that's a counterintelligence case, a counterterrorism case, a regular criminal case, follow the money. Well, if you can't follow the money, that's a little bit of, uh, of an issue. Now, as someone who values privacy and as someone who uh, is a privacy advocate, I have a little bit of a, of a problem with that being overly regulated. Again, my opinion, not the opinion of the Department of Justice or the FBI. But I will say this, is that there, there is going to have to be some sort of ability to, to look inside these virtual currencies not only for law enforcement purposes, but also for trust purposes, because you have people that actually invested real hard currency, right, in these bitcoins that are now gone. What type of storage facility? What You have a wallet, but you got to go beyond that. What sort of security systems can be provided so that trust can so that trust can be there? So I think the the issue is actually twofold. There is there is an issue inside the actual uh, virtual virtual currency community in that. Do we want to be part of the system? Do we not want to be part of the system? And then from a law enforcement perspective, it is how do we actually uh, how do we actually make sure that these, these currencies are being used properly? But then how also can they be part of the solution so that when something like this comes up, we actually have the access to get to the people that are using those sort of virtual currencies for things that they shouldn't be they shouldn't be purchasing. I'll ask one more question, then we'll open it up to, to audience um, everybody. Everybody really in this room, on the panel, in the world really will agree that preventing exploitation is, is a critically important task. Um, and if you talk about the importance of it, you can get people to nod their heads and agree. But then when you actually try to get resources to, to address that, whether it's through law enforcement cooperation, through education in the schools, uh, through engagement uh, across, the, across the private sector, it can be very difficult. Uh, it can be very difficult. So the question is, um, what can we do, or what should we be doing as a society to get more uh, attention and resources devoted to addressing these questions preemptively as opposed to reacting, which is unfortunately too often how we do that? Well, I'll be glad to begin. Please, if, if you'd like me to. Um, first of all, these are problems that the world does not see. Overwhelmingly, the victims are hidden victims. Um, you know, the victims of trafficking. Uh, trafficking is not reported to the police. The victims don't tell. Good people don't see it in their neighborhoods, even though it exists. Uh, the kids who are sexually victimized and whose images are on the internet don't tell anybody. Uh, the perpetrator is usually someone they know and trust, someone close to them, not some random stranger. So I think the, the single biggest challenge for us is simply to educate and inform uh, so that people understand what the true scope and scale of this problem is. Uh, the second challenge, and I hear this all the time from private sector funders as well as government funders, is these are not pleasant or happy issues. These are not things, this is not a problem that corporations tend to want to think about. Uh, believe it or not, it's easier to deal with a child who has some disease. Uh, there's also a tendency in this, in this issue to blame the victim. Uh, a friend of mine at the FBI said years ago on the issue of sex trafficking, uh, these cases are easy when there's an angelic five-year-old victim and an evil 50-year-old perpetrator. In reality, uh, the circumstances are usually a little different than that. You may have a victim who is 16 or 17 years old, who has been abused at home, who has been abused on the streets, uh, who at this point in her life is not necessarily all that sympathetic, and you balance that against uh, a 30-year-old businessman with a wife and three kids at home 
who looks like everybody else. Uh, my argument is that businessman is the criminal on this occasion. He's the one who's violating the law, and unless we begin to hold people like that accountable and treat the victims for what they are, what law enforcement historically, in this country at least, has done is they arrest the 15-year-old. They don't arrest the 30-year-old businessman. And when the businessman gets arrested, uh, the way the justice system can deal with them uh, is that they send them to John School, which is akin to traffic school. They say, well, you know, they're not really criminals. We shouldn't use the resources of our criminal justice system for that. As a result, there's enormous demand. And so I think the biggest challenge we have is to educate policymakers and average people so that we generate uh, a, a, a boomlet, a grassroots sense of demand that we need to do more for these hidden victims. And, and the last thing I'll say is we're also trying for the first time, we brought together a number of healthcare industries and leaders. And our argument is this is not just a legal problem. It's not just a law enforcement problem. It's a public health crisis that the victims suffer short-term and long-term. They suffer the obvious. They have four times the rate of PTSD as the rest of, of, uh, of kids their age. But long-term, there's research from the CDC and the Mayo Clinic that shows that these victims have higher incidence of heart disease, cancer, stroke, diabetes, and all of these medical impacts that affect their lives far greater than the rest of the population. So we have a massive, I'm sorry to make a speech, but we have a, a massive public education and policymaker education challenge. I'd like to answer this from a long term perspective. I'm certainly interested in Adrian's take from the industry perspective, and Amanda's take on what was the most frustrating part from, from that, from, a, from the victim perspective. But I'll, I'll start with, with a quick story. A guy, I, I, I was involved in, in something overseas one time, and, and I, I had made a suggestion that we go a certain route. And I was saying, we need to get these people involved, these people involved, we need to make sure these folks know, share with these people, share with these people. And my, uh, my partner from uh, the other side of the globe, he stopped me and he said, Cody, in the Arab world, we have a saying that says, in the absence of horses, don't saddle the dogs. <laughs> and I said, well, what do you mean by that? He said, don't just make a decision to be making a decision. Make a decision because it's the right decision. And I said, well, what do you mean by that? And he said, just because somebody might be a good partner doesn't mean that they're a good partner. And what I, and, and what I mean by that is sometimes in this, in this business, and then I think with this particular entity, we tend to think, let's get, let's get as many people involved as we possibly can. Well, from a law enforcement perspective, with limited resources, and, and California is a great place to look at this, law enforcement, especially local law enforcement, is really stretched thin. Uh, in, in this state, it, it is in Texas as well, other states, and they're, the folks on a local level do the best they can with what they have. So we try to have, in the FBI at least, a trickle-down partnership strategy. And I will say this, for those of you interested in any of these types of topics, Michaela Ludwig, our Los Angeles uh, Strategic Partnership Board, is actually sitting in the office, or sitting in the audience here, in our office here, would be happy to assist in, in forming these partnerships. But let me talk about partnerships on the strategic level. What I mean by that is we have to educate the law enforcement people, especially on the technology. I think that's where, if I, uh, if, if I had to give one overarching complaint that I think I've heard, it's that local law enforcement sometimes doesn't understand the actual technology that we use to facilitate some sort uh, of exploitation or attack. So from our perspective, we have to do a better job of proliferating that information down. What are we seeing? What are the trends? What do you need to be looking for? And we need to do that at the state level, and then we also have to do it at the local level. That means stretching our resources thin on the federal level, but we've got to do that to combat this in the right way. Um, I have some. Uh, you know, I agree as a journalist, I think it's really important to educate people, and that's, you know, basically all that I have the power to do. Um, and one thing I think it's really important to note when you're talking about like the exploitation of women online is that it is a serious drain on a woman's resources to be harassed. Uh, so a few years ago, um, I encountered a reader who um, 
was basically stalking me on the internet and over the phone. He would call me and threaten to rape me, made comments on all of my stories, and write on his blog about what he wanted to do to me. Uh, and so after I called the police uh, and they um, failed to investigate it, I decided to get a restraining order against him. Um, and I was very happy that in D.C., where I was living at the time, they had just recently changed the law to allow me to get a restraining order against someone who uh, was not uh, a family member of mine or an ex-boyfriend, but just a random stalker. Uh, and so I did, but what I didn't understand at the time was that it was going to take so much of my money and my time to pursue that. Uh, so because he wouldn't open the door when the police came to his house to try to serve him, I hired a process server, which was costly, to give him the papers. Um, from there, you know, we went to court uh, and had a, a little trial. Uh, but I had to keep coming back because my case uh, kept getting pushed back and it wasn't called up. So I went to court about five times over a couple of weeks. And I was lucky enough to be working someplace that would allow me to take off of work to do that. A lot of people are not that lucky. Um, and so I think it's important to note that all of these things are, are such a drain on people. They, I sort of call it a tax on women. Um, and it, it's not just a drain on us, but also on our employers. So uh, times when I'm getting a restraining order or I'm being harassed and it just sort of takes me out of the thoughts that I have and sort of ruins the work that I'm doing for that day, uh, it impacts me and it impacts my employer, um, it impacts like the world economy eventually. Um, so I think if you can sort of understand that, it makes more sense to people to put resources toward preventing that from happening. Thank you, Denise. And Mr. Allison mentioned, if anyone's interested in asking a question, you should come up here and stand by the mic so your have you ask a question. Any, anything in comments from, from you? Um, yeah, so I don't know what the original question was. Um, but yeah, the uh, original the question was, what, what can we do um, you know, to, to get more attention to this right. issue? I guess the one question, is there actually more of it? Is there more of it? Well, I'm contagion. And I think, I think there is more of it. And, and let, me, let me give you, I don't have any metrics. I don't have any empirical data. In 2002, we started a child victim identification program as a result of a bizarre Supreme Court decision in which the court, without clearly understanding what they were dealing with, uh, decided that virtual child pornography was protected speech. So uh, if the image was of not a real child, but a virtual child, you could do that. Um, anticipating the problems that were going to flow from it, we started a child victim identification problem. And we asked law enforcement to send us images uh, so that we could identify child victims and recognize new child victims and try to get them help. Uh, 2002, we received 50,000 images. Uh, last year, we received 22 million. 104 images and videos in the 104 million images and videos in the past 10 years. Now, I think the problem was there, but I think what the internet has done is create this sense of global community. So suddenly, people who have this interest which historically and today we would view as aberrant and unnatural and, and obviously unlawful in most of the world, suddenly discover that there are lots of people around the world with the same interests that they have. And therefore, they have a vehicle for communicating instantly and now anonymously. So I think this is one of those things where clearly the technology didn't create the problem. But I think the technology has facilitated uh, an exponential growth in the problem. Uh, yeah, so um, let me just um, uh, reiterate John's request that you, if you have a question, you come up. And if you would identify yourself, we're recording the entire session. So if you don't come up, your question won't get on tape. And, and viewers won't have the benefit of hearing it. Um, so while you're coming up, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna actually follow on um, your your general question, and, and Cody, this is a question to you about Amanda's initial story, and it's two part. One, uh, what should the Palm Springs Police Department have done? And given that law enforcement in general, when it 
thinks it cannot solve a crime, devotes resources to those crimes they think they can solve, where should we be developing the capacity to uh, prosecute uh, this kind of criminal activity? Um, well, I'll start by saying I, <clears throat> I don't want to indict the Palm Springs Police Department because I, I, I don't know the particulars other than what I read in Amanda's story, which is an excellent, excellent piece of journalism. Um, I, I will say this. Uh, probably in that situation, once once someone sees from a law enforcement perspective that, that, that the Internet has been used, probably should reach out to the FBI at that, at that, at that point and reach out, as the, as, as the lady said here, to some sort of federal entity to figure out, all right, this was this is going to be something that involves multiple jurisdictions, possibly international uh, components. So we need to reach out to it to the federal level. And I actually uh, actually sent Amanda's article to uh, some of our folks at, at our uh, our behavioral analysis unit and some others that we specifically asked that question. And their question was, "Tell her to give us a call." <laughs> and I said, "Well, I will pass that message along, but." In victims in, in other in other situations uh, such as Amanda, what should happen? What should we do? What sort of message should we be providing? And again, it comes back to this partnership piece, and it comes back to this education piece, and us getting down to that local level, to letting uh, local law enforcement departments, state entities, know that what the issues are in this area, and what are some of the technologies being used. But then, exactly, Jr., what you said: what are the steps if you encounter a victim? What should you do? And that's on us. That's on other entities. That's on other federal other federal entities to to develop that education piece and then to proliferate it out. But I will say this at a very basic level: if something like this does happen to you, contact your local FBI office. We have a complaint agent on duty 24 hours a day that will address uh, your issue, especially if it's something emerging, uh, such as a, uh, an actual situation in which you feel threatened. I just want to say in my defense that I did call the FBI and they were unhelpful. But I'm, <laughs> <laughs> just to clear the air. But um, I'm hoping that could change. Actually, I will. Um, one of the things that I've seen is that uh, when we look at some of the problems that are happening, the, the actual description of what the problem is and how you go about detecting or following up afterwards provides a very clear recipe for other offenders. And that's a real problem. There, there was a, an incident in the UK uh, where um, a child was effectively uh, solicited and then extorted um, effectively in a three-minute conversation over chat. Uh, it was very simple. Uh, to talk about that in any detail provides a very simple to follow recipe for how you use it and you perpetrate. So it, it's a real problem. Uh, and and the sort, sorts of people that we're talking about cross all economic social boundaries there, everybody. Uh, from any statistics and other statistics I've heard, effectively there's likely one person in each room. And there's one person on the floor in the earth as well. We don't know who they are. As much as I don't like to think about it, there's one or two people on my floor being dinged at Microsoft, statistically. Um, so you know, it's a difficult thing to think about, particularly when you might be asking those people to help you. I think this is our last question, then we'll let our, uh, let our folks go. So a lot of the discussion in terms of solution orientations have focused in one of two areas. Uh, one, making the mechanics of identification and prosecution more effective um, and, and trying to find ways of supporting the victim. And then second, public education and, and, and outreach. Uh, what we really haven't talked about in any general way, uh, and, and touched on in Bitcoin, but is changes in public policy, changes in the law. Um, now Ernie, you mentioned um, peeling back the veil of anonymity and making that legal. I, I, I suspect that's already legal with court orders and things like that if the technology is there. My question to the panel is, what, what if any, are the broad policy changes that we need to develop and adopt 
if we're going to adapt to these technological changes and and cultural behavior that might have existed outside of uh, digital technologies, but but is now more easily perpetrated, um, you know, in in that environment. My only request is to keep the answer short because we've got one more person to ask a question. Well, let, let me say from a from a policy standpoint, uh, one of the things we've been doing is uh, promoting model law around the world. A uh, hundred parliaments have enacted new law on child pornography, but there's still, I forget the actual number, 63, I think, countries where child pornography is not even a crime. Uh, and probably half or more than half of the countries on the planet today, it's not a crime to possess child pornography. It's a crime to produce it, to distribute it, uh, but not to possess it. Um, as it relates to human trafficking, um, the UN um, protocol, the 15 or 20 words that follow that on, on this issue, uh, does not include uh, the advertising and marketing of human beings for sex. It addresses their recruitment, um, but it doesn't address the fundamental change that has happened. Uh, the Council of Europe Cybercrime Convention similarly is silent. Uh, on, on that aspect. One of the things we've been working on in the United States is there, the, the major company uh, that is in the business of running adult sex ads uh, is estimated uh, to make $5 million a month on those ads. Um, there is federal law that basically treats that company in the same way that it treats Microsoft or Google or, or Yahoo basically as publishers of the content. So they are protected, they are immunized, uh, and, and they have basically become the information infrastructure for the prostitution business in the United States. That includes both adults and, and juveniles. Um, so there is still a lot that can be done both domestically and internationally uh, on, on the policy front. And also on the policy front, I think one of the greatest challenges is to emulate something that we created with the FBI in 2002 uh, called Innocence Lost on the trafficking issue that created multi-jurisdictional task forces. Um, 100, I think now 13, 100 and 1,300 traffickers have been successfully prosecuted in the United States in the past 10 years. Eight of them have gotten life sentences. Many of them have gotten 20 years and up. That was because of the leadership of the FBI, which was unprecedented and historic. But what we face in this country and around the world is a network of silos. Agencies address this problem from their unique perspective, like the parable of the blind man and the elephant. Nobody talks to anybody. Cross discipline. Uh, law enforcement needs to work with social services and, and health care and education and needs to share information and across jurisdiction. Local jurisdictions need to share information and work in, in task forces with state and federal and countries need to also take regional approaches. So all of that needs to be addressed at the policy level. One more question. I'll, I'll add it later. I have something for you, but we'll talk. Yeah, just uh, the final question here. And Bernie pointed out that um, this is something that happens, um, that it's not some mysterious boogie man that does this. Um, and that was the case before the internet. When people used to talk of rape, everybody always thought it was some stranger that would jump out of the bushes at their child when actually it's a family member very frequently. So um, that's just moved with technology as well. Um, and um, I, I want to know um, how rare is it for a child to actually report either in this country or do you hear from people in other countries, how rare is it for a child to actually step up and say, it was my mother that gave permission to film or for a sibling to come out and say, um, my mother gave permission um, for somebody to abuse, and, and it happens to boys as well as girls, uh, to abuse my sibling and to distribute the rights to this for, for a fee that's like 
to us maybe next to nothing, but to them perhaps a fortune. The, the best data uh, today, and, and let me preface this by saying that reporting today has increased dramatically over it where it was a generation ago. Yes, self-reporting. But even today, the best data, the most aggressive data, indicate that one in three kids tell. Um, so two in three kids don't tell anybody. And what we saw at the National Center from these now 104 million images as we've tried to identify these children is when a child is sexually abused and that abuse is memorialized on film uh, or on a, a still image, reporting plummets to virtually zero. These kids don't tell because their abuse is captured on film or video forever for the world to see. So that's the single biggest problem we have to overcome is that the victims don't, don't report. Okay, well, I think we should uh, uh, thank everyone, uh, our panelists, for a really interesting session. So thank you very much. And, and, uh, and I'd also like to thank uh, Susan Woodward and Christian Zarate and Colleen Callahan so for um, helping. So uh, thank, thank you all for coming. And um, we'll be doing more of these events next year. So I hope to see some of you back next year. Thank you.